click subscribe, click the thumbs up on our messages, click the little bell. Get your friends saved, get your family saved. Today I'm going to be also not only talking about healing, but I'm going to be talking about deliverance. And deliverance is the casting out of devils. And I have a little bit of experience, as many of you know, in this area. And I've seen some, I've seen some really exciting things happen uh, to me in praying over people over the last 40 years. But I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in deliverance. I don't know if there are any experts out there, but I'm not an expert. But I do study, I pray, and I have a fair amount of experience and a fair amount of, of success in praying over people. And I recognize that one of the things that happens is a lot of people, they think they got a devil when really all they have is an untrained spirit that they have refused to put under control. So we're going to try to differentiate today between uh, demons uh, that are pestering people and just simply a, an untrained spirit that's unwilling to bring it into submission to the word of God and submission to what's really right in the world. So let's start out in Mark chapter 16 this morning, and I'm going to pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name over this message here and over the service uh, Father, I ask that there, no weapon formed against anyone here or anyone watching, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And Father God, I ask that there be no distractions in homes, no distractions here, no distractions in people's minds, that they don't float and drift away and, and, and come under demonic attack. And I command that thing done right now, and I command the warfare to go out on our behalf and angels to be dispatched on our behalf in the name of Jesus to protect this congregation and our extended television family and online congregation all around the world. We have pastors watching all around the world right now and some of the churches that are watching. And just for, for your information, church, we have even some churches that have 300 people watching even now. And Father God, we thank you for that and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And Father God, I ask that uh, you protect me as I deliver this message and uh, give me a right word to say and a, and a healthy word to say, an encouraging word to say to your people. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, uh, Mark chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, you're going to need a Bible here today. If you want a Bible, raise your hands. So keep your hands up in the air so the ushers can get you a Bible. Ushers, if you would, look around the room. Mark chapter 16, verse 11. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. Talking about the disciples. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. So God has the ability, Jesus has the ability, the Father has the ability, angels have the ability to appear to humankind in forms other than that, what, of the glory than what they are really in. All right, so God will appear in less than his own personal glory, like he appeared to Abraham, uh, like uh, uh, other appearances of angels. Uh, many times angels appear as just human beings. They don't have wings on the back of them. They don't even look like they're very special. And he's appearing to them in forms other than his form of his glory. And he tones it down a little bit so that uh, we as human beings can handle his glory uh, because as, uh, as finite human beings, we can't handle the glory of God or even the g complete glory of Jesus in his present form now in his glorified state. In verse 12, after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, after that happened, he appeared, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. All right, so what he's doing is he's chastising them. He, he upbraideth them if he had the King James. And what that means is it means to rail, to chide, to taunt. He's really getting on their case. To, you know, if I say I'm, I'm going to go and upbraid somebody, that sounds pretty serious. And so he upbraided them. Imagine Jesus coming in now no longer in human form, but in a spiritual form as the risen son of God coming back and going to human beings and saying, you guys are amazing that you still don't believe in everything that I taught you. So he chided them. He taunted them. And what he said is, he said this, for their hardness of heart, and the hardness of heart is two words in the Greek. And again, I'm not an expert in the Greek, but I know how to study. 
And these two words make up this word hardness of heart. And in the Greek, it is sclerocardia. It's where we get the word in English today, the medical term in English for cardiosclerosis. It's a, it's a hardness of the heart or a hardening of the arteries. And what it means spiritually is that many people today in church, even when they come into personal contact with miracles and with Jesus, they have a hardening of their spiritual arteries. And that's where most of the church is today, because we are in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And we've grown cold to our own personal sin. We've grown cold thinking that we can get away with gross error and gross sin and nothing's going to be done about it. And it's okay. Don't worry. I'm I'm not going to talk about it, but it goes on. And that kind of thing, God is not going to put up with at the rapture. You'll say hello, but he'll say goodbye. And that's not going to be a fun time to be in. God's not looking for a perfect church, but a church that's at least willing to walk a little bit towards the rules and the laws that he has set up for all mankind. There can't be any more adultery. There can't be any more homosexuality. There can't be any more fornication. And those are the simple things, because you can see them, you can identify them. And then there's unbelief. The Apostle Paul talks about, lest any of you get through the the suffering, get hardness of heart and fall away because of unbelief. And that hardness of heart is that cardiosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, the spiritual arteries that we've gotten used to. A lot of preachers out there don't preach about sin anymore. And for that reason, it's even harder for one or two or 10 or a thousand preachers to preach about sin when 10,000 are not, because it's not being heard enough. There's nothing wrong with talking about sin. It doesn't bring us low, it brings us into line, it brings us into order. It saves your eternal life. And he reproached them. He said, you got hardening of the arteries, of the spiritual arteries, you still don't get it. You think that you have all the words. You walked with Jesus. Imagine being chewed out after walking with Jesus for over three years. And now you're getting another speech. And he's not no longer in human form. He's in superhuman form. And he appears to them. Verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This is something he told them already to do many times. This is our responsibility. What is the gospel? It is the good news. Why is it good news? Because the enemy's reign has ended. Everything that Satan has decided to do to humankind has ended. Now, let me give you a picture. Let me paint a picture. I need to paint this in your mind. All right, so we have the image of all the worlds being made, and he spoke the worlds into existence with a word. Vayomer Elohim, and he spoke it into existence. And God said. So every single time God did something, he said something in order to make it happen. Vayomer, and he said Elohim, and God said. So he spoke the world into existence, He caused everything to work. And even on on day six, he said, let the earth bring forth animals of every kind. So all the days have completed and we got the cycles of night and day. But then he makes a big change and he stops speaking. And he said, let us form man from the dust of the ground. Let us make Adam from the Adama. Adama is the Hebrew word for soil. It also means red or red soil. So mankind, not being hairy like all the other products that he made out there, you can see our skin and we have more of a reddish color than generally animals would have because their skin is covered. And so he makes Adam from, he forms Adam, he fashions him from the dust of the ground and we were made in his likeness and in his image, chapter 1, verse 26 of Genesis. So we're made in two ways. We're fashioned like a statue in what he looks like and the curvatures of what he looks like in his likeness and in his image. And in his likeness and image also means secondarily two words that are different. And then we have the inner mechanisms that he has. The animal kingdom doesn't have it. No matter how much you love your dog and how much of a personality you think your dog has and how much you think your dog gets your jokes, your dog is not a human. Your fish is not a human. 
the deer are not human, the bears are not human. We were made in a God class apart from everything else in creation. Not one fish, not one bear, not one dog was fashioned from the dust of the earth. We were the first ones. And ever since that happened, when the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Satan happened, at whatever time it happened, Satan wanted to mount up against God. He, wanted to, he did the five I wills. I want to become higher than God. I want to sit on his throne. I want to mount up to the uh, recesses of the north. I want to be like him. I want to put him down. And ever since then, Satan has been trying to attack God, but he can't attack God. All he can do is attack his image. All he can do is come up. He can look at the picture of God and try to tear it in half, rip it in half. He can look at the painting of God called humans, and all he can do is try to throw a bucket of paint on it to distort what God originally did in the garden. And what that means is, that means that Satan now has made us out to be his enemy, whether you like it or not. We're here already. You can't run away from that. You can't commit suicide and get away from Satan. In fact, you might end up with him by doing that. I don't want to say and make a declaration, but you know that's a possibility. But then we go and we live our lives and we commit a lot of self-suicide despite that. We allow us to be, ourselves to be manipulated by Satan and have God's image, God's holy image of, in us to be destroyed. First of all, just acting loony, just doing things you shouldn't be doing, driving too fast, driving drunk, all the things that, you know, law it says you're not supposed to do. And then there's other things. And then you're chasing after your neighbor's wife or chasing after your neighbor's husband. And that in, in Proverbs and in the New Testament, that is a sin unto death. And you can destroy God's image. And then there's diseases that can be picked up from being socially active like that. And apart from that, then we go into other things, unbelief, unforgiveness. Mark eleven twenty four 24 and 25 says, if you will not forgive, neither will your heavenly father forgive you of your trespasses. Unbelief and unforgiveness are some of the major causes of loss of salvation and major causes of sickness and disease. Unforgiveness makes people sick. It is self-suicide. Forgiveness is an act of your will, not an act of feeling. You don't forgive someone because you feel like it. You never forgive someone because you feel like it. You never stop chasing after someone sexually because you feel like it. You do it because of the right thing to do. You don't do it because it feels good. You do it because it's right to do because God instructed you to do it. And then he goes on to say, and he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. In other words, delivered in this life and in the life to come. Now recognize water baptism is not required. If you don't ever get water baptized, you'll still go to heaven. Water baptism is a great act to go through. And a lot of people, I've had a couple people already tell me in the past month, they want to get water baptized once again. That's great. All right, we're not going to do the, the frozen polar plunge. We'll find a, we'll find a pool somewhere. So we can't just do it anywhere. But if you want to be water baptized, that's great. But it is, a, it is a, a mark to you more than anybody else that you were saved. You go down under the water. You come back up over the water. Right? You immerse as a brand new person. You've been reborn. Verse 16 again. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Condemned by who? Condemned by Jesus himself at the white throne judgment. Condemned. That's a big statement. Does Jesus condemn? Yes, he does. These signs will accompany those who have believed. All right? Signs are evidence that there is power in the name of Jesus. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. 
So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. So this is the final statement before he sits down. This is at the very end of the 40 days. We read from the Gospels and even from the book of Acts that we know that Jesus walked around on the earth and appeared to over 500 people at one time. Many times he appeared to people where he was unrecognizable in order to give people instruction or encouragement. But then he had to go. And then we're given this instruction. Now, some of you grew up in churches or you even participating maybe in ministries now where people, they come to this section or you're reading a commentator or listening to someone, they go, well, that would, Jesus just told them that so they could get the Bible written, which is a lie of the devil. See, the devil wants your, the image of God in you destroyed. So if all the signs and all the miracles were only for the first hundred years, which is what it took from, from approximately 30 AD to 100 AD to get all the canonized books put together in what we call the New Testament. If that was true, then only 70 years roughly of people got to enjoy all the miracles of God. And now the rest of us here have to suffer and then we have to basically go back into the dark ages, so to speak, of, of spirituality not to have any power in our lives. And that's a lie of the devil. If you believe that, that's a lie. If you heard it, no, it's a lie. It, Jesus never said, in order to get the Bible written, in order to have the next books accepted and written, in order for us to have miracles. Why, why show a kid, listen, your birthday's coming up, and I want to show you this picture of a bicycle. You already have a bicycle, and your older brother, he had a bicycle, so... I'd like to get you this bicycle. And then the birthday shows up and your young second son says, where's my bicycle? I said, well, you already had a bike. And your older brother had a bike, even though he's moved out of the house and took him the bike with him. You had a bike, so that's good enough. That's what that's like doing it. God is a good father, not a bad father. He doesn't show us something and tell us we can't have what he wants to give us. Amen. And so if you believe that these things, these miracles were only for a 70 year period of time so we could have a canonized New Testament. Not only are you mistaken, but those that are trying to tell you that miracles are not for today, they are grievously mistaken. Miracles not only are for today, they're supposed to be commonplace in our life. They should be common everyday occurrences. If you're praying and you're praying for a miracle, but miracles aren't for today, you're wasting your time. God, 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 God. I need this miracle. And then some so-called Christian comes your way and hears about the thing that you're standing faith for. Well, you know, you know, that's a lot for God to do. After he made all the worlds, after he created the stars and the sun and the moon and the galaxies, after he created the Milky Way, he doesn't want to give you a miracle? That's ridiculous. It would make God out to be psychotic, that he wants to taunt you that, hey, I gave miracles just to, just to prove that Jesus was my son, but that doesn't mean you're going to have him today. That's a lie of the devil. See, the devil wants to destroy God's image. So if he can destroy it through sin, if he can destroy it through sickness, if he can destroy the, God's image, he can't attack God. All he can do is attack what he created. If he can destroy the image of God in the earth through Lack, through arrogance, through sin, through unbelief, then Satan's won. Because he hasn't given up. He's still, he's still trying to write his Bible. He's still trying to have miracles on the negative side happen his way. We would be helpless for 1,900 years. And that's simply not true either. Amen? Amen. So, Jesus here, he is... He's experienced preaching in the natural. He's experienced evil spirits that were cast out. He's experienced rejection in two ways. First, he was rejected by his own nation. And then for a short period of time, while he was on the cross, he was rejected by his own father intentionally. Because he said so. He said, he said, why have you rejected me? While he's hanging on the cross. And he was rejected only temporarily by his father. He experienced death. Then he experienced resurrection. He accepted his role to redeem us. And he came to the earth to do that. 
Now he appears with more ministry to the disciples and he wants to give them this ministry. And he says, go out and preach the gospel. And this is something that I've had to change in myself for those that have followed me for two decades or more. He wanted us to preach the gospel, not current topics, not catchy themes, not current films, not politics, because all that stuff is itchy ears and it's all temporal. It doesn't do anything. And there's a lot of people doing all these things and trying to be, uh, they're, they're trying to do everything to appeal to the current societal belief systems. And all that is just going to be washed away. That's not really preaching the gospel. God wants us each individually to preach the gospel. We can't preach the gospel if we don't have our lives right. People look at us and they go, man, you're still cheating on your husband. You're still cheating on your wife. You're still doing, you're still doing this and you go to that church. What good is, what, 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 what thing do you expect to happen in me if it hasn't happened in you? And again, many times, even though we're being pestered by demons, many times so much of what we have hanging in our life can be easily broken off. Most of the stuff people have are not addictions. They're simply behaviors. And there's a difference between an addiction and a behavior. A behavior means you start up the car drawn to the right, wrong side of town. An addiction is, I just have to have another cigarette. Both can be broken, but one is more our will and the other one is more something we need to break off that physiological addiction to nicotine or whatever it might be. So he then he says, it's part of the proof. I want you to have signs. I want you wonders. And not so that the Bible can be written. And he talks about the demonic realm. And he says this in verse 17, these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name, they will cast out demons. In whose name? In the name of Jesus. If you know the Hebrew, in the name of Yeshua. However you want to do it. I like doing it both ways, depending on uh, where I'm at and, and if I'm in front of people. If people don't know Hebrew, I'm not going to use the term Yeshua. I'm going to keep it simple and say, in the name of Jesus. I don't have to shout it, but I like to shout. So if, you, if you're a shouter like me, just shout it out, right? There's power in the name of Jesus, like we sung this morning. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now, the demonic realm is very, very real. There are a lot of people in churches, a lot of pastors say because they've been taught wrong or they just don't have a heart to God to really know what's going on, but the demonic realm is extremely real. If we have two of God's angels to one of his fallen angels, which we'll call demons, then even though God's angels are two more than the one, the one they operate rebelliously on their own. We have to dispatch the two. We have to make sure we're walking in the proper way to have those two against one to fight on our behalf. Many times we complain, but we don't pray. Many times we say, I want this, but we don't use the name of Jesus. And so you got angels, you know, with their wings at their side, you know, at least characteristically as we can imagine it, they're with their hands at their side and they're going, I got nothing to do because the order of things has not been released to me because they hearken unto the voice of his word, scripture says. Blessed are all ye angels, you mighty ones, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So when we utter God's word, utter the words of Jesus, utter it in the right context, and we finish it with, in the name of Jesus, now they're dispatched. Now they have permission to go because they hearken unto his word. And so they can go out and accomplish great things for us. Amen. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 8, Matthew 8, verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What we have, Jesus said, these things and greater things shall ye also do. That was over in the book of John. He's giving his final commands to the disciples before he goes to the cross. He said, these things 
and greater things you shall also do because I go to the Father. Why does he go to the Father? He said, so that the Holy Spirit can come with you, the Comforter, the Paraclete. And he can come and he can give you the authority that I currently have. And he said, greater things than these shall you also do. So if we do twice what Jesus did, that's not something that Jesus said can't happen. If we do three times, if we do five times of the miracles that Jesus did in his lifetime on the earth, then that's not a sin against ourselves or a sin against scripture. Jesus said, these things and greater things shall you also do. Greater things might be greater times. Might be greater things in the immensity of it because of the mechanical age. However, it happens. So Jesus now has demonstrated that we as Christians today have authority over the natural things of the earth, over wind, over sea, over earthquakes. We have, we have authority over what happens on the earth. Then the next thing, verse 28. And when he came to the other side into the country of the Gardenes, two men who were demon possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. Now this word demon possessed is interesting in the Greek that I could find in the Greek was only used here. When we see the word de words demon possessed in the English, what we found out studying several months back is that the terminology is to have a demon, not be possessed by a demon, which is different terminology. Here in the Greek, it's really interesting. When you're possessed by something, you're completely under control. If I possess my car, my car is under my control. If I possessed something in my house, a gl glass of water, that glass of water, I possess the glass, it's under, completely under my control. So to be demon possessed is to be completely under the control of whatever thing overshadows you or inhabits you. When we get saved, the Apostle Paul was clear in some 25 scriptures, he said that when we get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit and the temple of God. Your body is a temple. And again, Satan wants to destroy your temple and the image of that temple. Think about this image this way. Solomon builds the greatest temple, some have said even today that when they've calculated that no building on earth yet has been built like Solomon's temple. The first temple that was built that was not movable with the gold and the pomegranates and the cherubim and all the great statues and the carvings that were going on there that was absolutely beautiful. And it was destroyed. The temple was torn down. And Satan's desire is to tear down the God-given temple that you have called your body. And then secondarily, your mind. And finally, if he can get you, he wants to throw you all three persons into hell. Because he hates God. He can't attack God directly. It can't be a frontal assault. So he's got to knit and pick, just like what scripture says, nipping at his heel, Genesis chapter 3, serpent bites your heel. And he wants to attack you and nip at your heel, trying to get you to falter and to fall. If you knew how beautiful you are, if you knew how valuable your soul is, if you knew how valuable it is to God, how valuable your life is, if you really could see an image, a picture frame of how great you truly are, you would stop sinning the big stuff immediately. You wouldn't go back to sin. You would stop sinning immediately because you would see the beauty of who you are above all other creation. You would see your beauty. You would see your greatness. You would see how God envisioned you. And then God says in a, in a second way through Jesus and his parables, he said, then I, I dispatched you. I want to send you out. Do business. Occupy until I come. He wants you to go out without failure to go to the full course of your life, doing what you've been called to do, not held back. No more divorce. No more sin. No more driving to that side of town. No more prostitutes. I'm saying things by the Spirit of God here this morning. No more of the stuff that you've been doing. No more thefts. No more lying. These demon-possessed men, I've got to read this word here. It's two Greek words, and it's, I couldn't find anyone who could, who could back this up, but I, I looked at, at many books as I could on this. 
It's a two Greek words. The first part of this Greek word, it's a singular word, but it's broke, it's from two Greek words. And it's dehemoni, it's to demonize, dehemoni. The second part of this, it's demonomoni, zame, or zombie. To be demon possessed is to be a demon zombie. And you guys, too many of you are watching these dumb zombie movies. Zombie house flipping, my zombie cat. Uh, who knows what other zombie things are out there. Get rid of the zombies. To be a zombie is to be co totally controlled. And look at the programs. These are sinners making these programs, and they know more about the Bible than some of us. Because they got it right. And it comes from the Greek. To be a demon zombie, be under the complete control of those devils that are in you. And there's a devil of lust. There's a devil of lying. You don't have a devil of, you know, devils aren't all that talented. They only really have one little occupation in life, if you call it a life. And that is to just do one thing. So you've got a lying devil. You've got a contrite devil. You've got a whining devil. You've got a fornication devil. You've got an overeating devil. Uh, you've got a, um, a hiding devil. You've got all kinds of devils out there. And they come and inhabit a person. And if the Holy Spirit's here, and I don't want to be dogmatic about it or, or, or firm and say it's this way and no way other. But I believe that if we're saved, we have a measure of the Holy Spirit and would be pretty hard for a devil to want to stay in the presence of the Holy Spirit. However, we can be oppressed. And I've been oppressed. I've told many stories of just simple things where I would have a bout of anger while I'm a, while I'm a preacher over a salt shaker. And then ask myself the question, why did I do that? Was it a learned behavior? Partially. But if I haven't practiced it in five years, why did I just do it? It's because of demonic oppression in a learned behavior, which is what we call iniquity today. Sin is sin. Sin, you can see. Iniquity is the propensity to sin when you have the opportunity. So a child may have an iniquity of alcoholism, but he's only three. And when he has the opportunity to get into dad's you know, liquor cabinet, when he's eight, nine, or 10, or 15, or whatever, then he'll demonstrate his alcohol, the spirit of alcoholism that might be on him. But he can't demonstrate it every single time. So it's called an iniquity. It's the propensity to sin given the opportunity. David said in the Psalms, he said, I have kept myself from my iniquity. And we must keep ourselves from our iniquities. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what David said in so many other words. He said, I kept myself from my iniquities. James makes it more clear what the warfare is. He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist him, firm in your faith. Knowing that the temptations and the trials of, of the church, of all others, is no different than what we're experiencing right now. So you're not the first one to be tempted. And if you fell, you're not the first one to fall. And if you get back up, you're not the first one to get back up, dust yourself off and said, I'm never going down that road again. I'm not going there. So we have things that we need to repent of. And that's what's happening here. So you've got these demon zombies, zamahi, which easily could be read another way, zombie. Now define, possession means complete control. And I don't think you can be possessed, but you can be oppressed. And we have to resist. What's one of the easiest ways to resist? I'm going to say that four-letter word again here in church. You ready? It's called a fast. Because a lot of people think it's a four-letter word. They don't want to do it. I have many people telling me still now, I can't fast one meal. Yes, you can. You haven't even tried. You haven't even tried. So I just can't. I just can't. Well, you just keep saying you can't, and you won't. Because your confession matches, so you're, 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 you, your voice is more believable to you than the Word of God. 
So you need to stop saying that. Say, you need to start saying, I can fast, I can fast, I can fast. There was a time where I was telling my wife when I weighed about virtually nothing early in our marriage and we started fasting, practicing fasting now and again. I said, I'm, I'm going to gain five pounds every single time I fast. Now, if that were true, I'd be a little bit heavier than I am now. But I said that so that I would not be afraid of fasting, even though I was very thin at the time. Are you with me? Right? So I needed to eat more food than the average person, just because my makeup, you know, would burn up calories pretty quick. But I just believed God that I wasn't going to turn into a feather and blow away, that I was going to be. And fasting breaks the yoke. Fasting breaks yokes and reveals yokes that you don't even know that you have. What do we know about demons? We know, one of the things we know about them, that they're called disembodied spirits. Now, you can't find that terminology, language in the Greek or in, in, in your Bibles, but essentially that's what we're finding because what we find is they want to be in a body. They want to be embodied. So when they're out roaming, and it says they roam around in dry places, and then they return to the home that they were in, finding it swept and clean, they go out and, re and bring in seven demons more worse than, and, and the, in the Last state of the man is worse than the first state of the man. So when a devil is cast out, you have to fill yourself up with the Holy Spirit by getting saved. Now, I've done that with many people. I've cast demons out of them, and I, say, I just kneel down maybe to next to a wheelchair, and I go, do you want to get saved? Yes. Repeat these words after me. Yeah. I have examples. And if I have time today, I'll give those examples. But nevertheless, it's simple. It's not hard. We don't work ourselves up to it. We don't work ourselves into a, a lather trying to get to that place. We are dealing with demons. The, the demonic realm is very real. And let's keep reading. In verse 29, well, in verse 28, they were demon possessed and they were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And that word extremely violent there is, is the same words that's talked about Later on, by the Apostle Paul, he said that in the last days, people will be, and he goes on to describe it, and one of the words is the exact same word used to describe the extremely violent nature of these two men. In other words, that people in the last days shall be extremely violent towards their God, towards truth, towards revelation, towards obeying the laws of the land, Extremely violent. Do we see extreme violence today in the news? Absolutely. So what these demon-possessed men are, they're probably no worse than what we're seeing in the news. Verse 29, And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So they these demons inside, these two guys, recognize who Jesus is because demons know who Jesus is. All right? They live in the spiritual realm where Jesus came from. They know. They might lie about it, but they still know. They were in complete control, these two men. Now, verse 30, Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them, and the demons began to entreat him. Look at this, demons, plural saying, if you were going to cast us out, send us into that herd of swine. Well, we know from the other Gospels that they, they said, we do not want to leave this area. In other words, we have such influence on this area. Not only are we terrorizing these two men, but we are terrorizing the entire community. We make noise at night. We scratch ourselves with rocks and cut ourselves. We beat up anyone coming along the way. We kill people. We make it hard for people to sleep and have a normal life. That's what demons want to do. And what are demons? Demons are, by nature, unclean. When I was in Israel, the two times that Kathy and I were in Israel, we were shocked with giant row houses, beautiful condominium row houses that were personally owned. And they were owned by Jews and then non-Jews. Jews and non-Jews. Row houses. One development, one house, two stories high, perfectly clean, perfectly clean backyard right down to the fence line down by the highway. Immediately, six inches away, that same width of space, dirty, unmowed, filled with trash, 
ha trash hanging out of the windows, sheets hanging out, the roofing coming apart. I don't even know how that happened. And then the next one you could tell was owned by a Jew again. What do the Jews have that many other people don't have in Israel? They have the word of God. They may not be messianic, but they at least have the word of God. What do we know about the word of God? It produces economic blessing. And the economic blessing is on anyone who follows the word of God. So good, yuck, good, yuck, good. And you could see the uncleanliness. Anytime someone is living in filthiness or uncleanliness, it is the sign of some demonic activity that you haven't gotten out of your life yet. Well, no, I'm just, you know, we're just kind of crowded. I'll tell you what, you can be crowded and clean. You can be crowded and clean. Not taking care of yourself is a, a sign of uncleanliness. What did Jesus say? If you're fasting, go and wash your face and anoint your, anoint your head with oil. Why? So you look clean, even when you're fasting. So Jesus says, so your body is a temple. It's the human soul is the most valuable thing. And when you allow your temple to live in uncleanness or have uncleanness around you, you're not idolizing your temple the way you should. Anytime you let sin in there, if you knew how valuable you are, but how close you can be to losing your salvation, you would, it's not the fear of God. You would just wake up and go, this just makes complete sense to me. Some of you don't have demons. All you have is a behavior problem that you don't want to end. Well, I just don't know how to say no. Well, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't practice that. If part of your lifestyle is causing you to go into sin, change your lifestyle. Lifestyles are changeable. You're not chained to your lifestyle. Amen. Well, I, I, I go to work over here. Well, why don't you get a job somewhere else? Because if they all go out to the bars afterwards and you can't help yourself and you're spending all your money and you're gambling it all away. By the way, gambling is demons taking advantage of weak people and destroying their finances. Who gets rich in gambling, right? There's a song that was made back 100 years ago. I'm the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo being large gambling right next to Nice, France, right? One man broke the bank. Everyone else lost. People lose, take their yachts in there, the million dollar yachts, and gamble them away and lose all their wealth in a couple days. That's not God. That's not God. Right? Anytime we participate in anything that's causing others to stumble, we should try to remove ourselves from that as much as we possibly can. That doesn't mean we, we pull ourselves out of the world. The Apostle Paul said, we are not of the world, but we're still in the world. We're still in the world. God gets that. We don't seclude ourselves and, and start a monastery and say, okay, now I'm not going to have any sin around me. No, we go out into the highways and the byways. We walk in the midst of wolves as innocent as lambs. That's what we do. We don't pick up the smell of the world just because we're in it. We can do a lot of different things that we have permission for. We have permission for so much, but we don't have to become like the world around us while we're doing it. And if you don't become like the world around you, then people see, oh, no, I can do that too. I can have the strength to do that too. What other things do we know that demons are by nature? First of all, know that demons have characteristics and behaviors that they want to express through a human being. They're disembodied spirits until they take something over. Why is it? Ask yourself this question. Why is it during the millennial reign that the book of Isaiah talks about that the lion shall lay down with the lamb and the, and the child shall put his hand in the cobra's den and there shall not be any hurt in all my holy mountain, says the Lord, says Yahweh the Lord. How can we go from mosquitoes biting us, flies being a pest, cats killing mice, dogs chasing cats, wolves chasing dogs, and so on, how come we have that hierarchy in the natural world right now, and yet that's going to just disappear during the millennial reign. There isn't going to be much that's going to change except for one major thing. Satan and all of his fallen angels will be locked up for a thousand years. Every one of them. Maybe billions of them. 
So mosquitoes aren't going to hurt in all, that, all his holy mountain. Mosquitoes. I mean, I don't even get it. If you're a demon and you can only be in a mosquito, I mean, I, I'm not going to try to, don't even try to answer, ask me to answer that question. I, I don't know the answer. But I know mosquitoes aren't going to be biting you during a millennial rain. You won't be going, to, you won't be going up to Jerusalem and say, Jesus, I love this whole millennial thing that you're putting together here. Man, this is wonderful. Grapes are growing. I'm, I'm having a better time than, than my ancestors did in, in human form. Uh, but what's with the mosquitoes? <laughs> you won't have that question. So demons cause a lot of problems. They're unclean. They're filthy. They have characteristics and personalities that want to be expressed through human beings or, or, or your dog or your cat or your animals. You can have farm animals that are demon-possessed. Do you ever hear of Ghost in the Darkness? Two lions that were killing people repeatedly, right? Movie was made out of it. Val Kilmer was in it. It was several movies made out of it. True story. They actually shot them and they're mounted somewhere, I think in India or Africa, somewhere. Blasphemy. I hear Christians often using, saying GD. That's blasphemy. I hear uh, people, you know, saying things against the Holy Spirit and their preachers. That's blasphemy. By the way, that blasphemy will not be forgiven. I hear many Christians cursing all the time. Cursing, just bad cursing all the time. I mean, no break. Lying can be a demon, a lying demon. Many lying demons are out there. A demon of lust. Or how about a demon of slander, where you're sl constantly slandering your neighbor or your spouse or your children? Listen, if you won't love your children privately, no one else publicly will love them either. You'll actually, you can actually put demons on your kids by not loving them and loving them right. And by the way, loving them doesn't mean smothering them with love, but not disciplining them. Contempt is a spirit. Many of the Jews and the leaders of the Jews had contempt for Jesus. Contempt is, I'm better than you, you're not who you think you are, and contempt creates unbelief. Contempt also creates resentment, but that's a different spirit, a spirit of resentment, a spirit of adultery, a spirit of fornication. How about a spirit of greed, where you're so greedy, you just got to cheat people just to, for the sake of making an extra $10? Why not just give them the $10 and forget about it? Why not just do a favor for someone? Then there's the, not, not just the uncleanliness, but the spirit of filthiness. Being filthy, intentionally filthy. Hoarders are filthy. Many people, I've, we've had people come to church that were hoarders. You walk into their home and you got, you're kidding me. These are demons that cause people to act like that. That's not normal. Jesus, I don't believe, ever walked into a, a home in Israel somewhere and, you know, he saw pots and pans stacked up on the side of, of the hall as he walked in that were unwashed. Now, if you're putting your pots and un unwashed pots and unwashed pans and unwashed dishes and, and stuffing them into a draw, you might have a demon. You're not demon possessed, but you've got to get over that. I don't know how you get rid of that. You can clean that demon, can't you? You can have other bodily problems. You can, be, you can have insanity. You can have recurring bad health. You can have mental sicknesses, like I said, insanity, but other types of mental sicknesses that are described today, bipolar and all that, right? I've been to the prisons. When I was at the prisons and sometimes 100, 150, 200 men would be in the prisons, I would talk to them afterwards and they'd all be medicated, all of them. So what are you medicated for? Well, I did this, this, and this. And I recognized after a period of time, because I was in there long before I started the church, that these people, they were being medicated to hide their type of insanity. It didn't get rid of it, it just covered it. I would have deliverance services sometimes. Sometimes I wouldn't be able to pray over everyone, but I could pray maybe over 10 or 20 men before they walked back to their confinement area. How about... Jesus dealt with this, paralysis, blindness. Remember, he put, washed, made mud with spittle, put it on the man's eyes. And, you know, he said, what do you see now? He said, we, men look like trees. Then he did it again. How about deafness, the spirit of deafness? How about mute spirit, epilepsy, melancholy? Well, there's one for you. 
There are a lot of people in the church today that are melancholy. They're just, oh, how you doing? It's going to be a great day today. It's going to be really warm. I heard you got a raise. How's your kid doing in school? I saw that they were, uh, got straight A's. That's melancholy. Right? You wonder why people aren't asking how you're doing anymore? They're tired of hearing the, I don't know. That's a demon. You have to know what you're dealing with. That's not normal. It's not normal to be mourning for a dead child for 10 years. Normal mourning might be a week, two weeks, even a year, if you want to go that long. But if you're going over a year, if most of the time, if you're going over a couple months, that is a mourning spirit. That is a demon trying to keep you depressed so that you are not living up to your potential. Well, they died and I'm hurt by it. Yeah, life and death is part of life. It happens. We still have a life to live. And if you don't want to have two dead people, one dead and one walking zombie, then you bring yourself back to life again. And, but it's up to you. It's like forgiveness. I've had people come to me and say, I just can't forgive God. They were in my church. I can't forgive God for what happened to my baby. What do you mean you can't forgive God? It's been a year now, two years, five years, ten years. What do you mean you can't forgive God? You haven't seen other people die? You think it's untouched? We don't get close to it at all? Yet it happens all the time. God wants you to live. You're still here. If he didn't take your life, if he didn't allow your life to be taken, then you still have a responsibility here. And not to prove to everyone that you can be a 10-year mourner. I'm preaching, church. I need to hear an amen. amen. Demons, they possess, but I don't believe Christians, but they do oppress. They dethrone a man's mind. They dethrone a man's will, his emotions, and then finally his body. You know what it means to be dethroned? To be dethroned means you're on the throne of your own life, and something happens, and he tells you, step off the throne, it's okay. So you step off the throne, and you're no longer in charge of your life. Well, you know, I, you know I'm, the older we get, the wiser we should get, not the more brittle we should become. Too many of you old people are too brittle. Let me look into the camera here. Give me a, a close-up. Too many of your old people are too brittle. So, well, this happened to me. Well, that was 20 years ago, 40 years ago. You're supposed to be stronger today, not more brittle. If all we have to look forward to is the breakdown of emotions in an old man, why live to be an old man? We should be strong enough to encourage the faint-hearted, Scripture says to strengthen those that are weak and feeble. It's time that you made your old age your best years, not your melancholy years. Give God the glory here this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, church. <laughs> Demons to throne a man from what he really wants to do. I'd really like to be in charge of my life. Well, maybe you have a demon, but maybe you haven't tried. Maybe you haven't repented. You know, we have repentance at least once a month in this church when we receive communion. I go through it. I said, you know, we have to judge ourselves so we are not judged. How many of you truly judging yourself? Really, 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 really judging yourself. The only person that's hearing it is you and God, and God's not surprised. The first time you say it, God's not in heaven going, hey, Peter, did you just hear that? I didn't know that they were doing that. He's not going, whoa. Whoa, what happened here? He's going, wow, they humbled themselves and recognized something wrong inside of themselves. What do you need to do that's your responsibility in getting free from demonic attack and really, in part, in a great part, delivering yourself from demonic attack? First of all, you have to close all the open doors in your life. I was single, and I remember I was in my hometown. I was 17 years old. I had a hot rod. I, I built hot rods. I worked in a garage and raced cars with my boss. And 
I had a hot rod Volkswagen. And I'm telling you, you've never seen a hot rod Volkswagen like mine. Straight pipe stack in the back, super wide tires, come out four inches past the giant wheel wells that I had. And I came down the road, you knew I was coming. I don't know why I said all that. <laughs> Cast down that spirit of pride in Jesus' name. <laughs> and I remember there was a girl that just would not date me. And I'm, mm. so I just drive past her house all day, you know, after school and probably antagonize her father, and rev my engine, put it in neutral and rev my engine as I coasted by. And finally I had some, one of my friends came to me and go, why are you wasting your time? She's not even interested in it. She said, I know this other girl that's interested in it. She's a lot prettier. I was wasting my time. A lot of us are wasting our time going to places we're not supposed to be going to. We're wasting our time with old behavior, thinking it's going to cause a change or we're going to get some excitement out of it. You have a responsibility to deliver yourself. You have to deliver yourself. Stop going to the bar if that's the problem. Stop going to the casino if you're spending all your money. Stop going to places you're not supposed to be going to. If you've got your druggy friends over there in that side of town, drive to the other side of town where the church is. Call up one of your friends and say, man, I need prayer. I'm driving around my dealer's house six times and I'm about to run out of gas. So I'm going to be in trouble if I do. I need prayer. Call up someone that can, can stand in the gap with you. Close all open doors in your life. Sin is nothing more than suicide. It's self-murder. If you knew that adulterers and fornicators go to hell, if you truly knew it and understood it, you would stop it now. So, well, I just don't know how to say no. Really? With all the advertisements to just say no for the past 40 years, you still can't say no? Let's go over to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. Verse 8, and he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. This is, this is the Apostle Paul. When some of them were becoming hardened and disobedient, in other words, hardness of heart, right, cardiosclerosis, speaking evil of the way before the people. That's a demon on these people doing this. He withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And they took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. This is a powerful ministry. Watch what happens. Verse 11. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. How hard is it to cast on an evil spirit. They don't want to be around. How many of you have said, as I've instructed you many, maybe hundreds of times over the past decade, have ever said to yourself, I cast that thought down in the name of Jesus? If you've said it once, great. But I do it sometimes five, six, a dozen times a day. I might be doing it as I'm waking up in the morning and as I'm going to bed at night. I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus. You got a bad dream, you wake up and say, I cast that thought down in the name of Jesus. What is that thought? Many times it's a demon because you just had a nightmare. Nightmares don't come from the Holy Spirit and they don't come from your dog and they don't come from eating chili food just before you go to bed. Nightmares come from demons. I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus. Everyone say, I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus. That's not hard. And guess what? Immediately the thought will go away. Now, if you've got to say it a second time, do it. Let's keep reading. All right, so verse 12 again. So that handkerchiefs or aprons that were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. That's nothing special. That's not special. But it is good news, isn't it? It's good news that it's that easy. Right? So I'm not going to pray over you here this morning and stomp my feet and yell and throw dust in the air and uh, wave a cane over you hoping that the demon will leave. All right? This is not superstition and this is not witchcraft. When I pray over you here today, I'm just going to do it real quick. I'm not going to listen to your prayer. I'm just going to pray over you. 
And if, if I stop and pray over you, then be quiet. No praying in other tongues, no praying, just be quiet. And as I pray over people, I'm being instructed by God how to do this. As I pray over you, then just know that the demons aren't going to want to stay there if you got one. But if you got a demon, that's not really a demon. It's just a bad habit because you refuse to clean up your life. And you stand up and walk out here and go, well, nothing happened to me. Well, nothing happened because you have a personal responsibility to yourself. Let's keep reading. But some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. These are not saved Jews. They're not messianic. They just want to have some fun spiritual time. By the way, if anyone invites you to go to a place to cast out evil spirits and they just want some simple joy, don't go. Unless you know that they're a rock hard in the body of Christ. They're the rock of Gibraltar. They are firm. They're not wussy, whimsical, let's go cast spirits out of someone. Please do not go with them because you may be dealing with demons that are far greater and then you can be attacked. You can bring demons back from any meeting you've been at. You can go to a bar or to a place or even to a restaurant and pick up demons and go home. You can go to a hotel room and pick up demons from that hotel room that have been hanging out there and bring them back to your house 500 miles away. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? He knows who Jesus is. He knows who Paul is, but he goes, you don't have the authority to use this. So if you're going to use the name of Jesus, you have to be saved first. You have to call on his name first. You have to be filled with his spirit. And the man whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them. So they fled out of the house and naked and wounded. That's funny. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And the fear came upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Why? Because we're not reading the perfect order of everything here. We're just given a general story that Paul's continuing to preach Jesus. Many also who uh, had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. So what's required today? To cast out demons? Not so much, but to repent. Repent, stop. The things you're doing in darkness, God knows about. And many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver or maybe $100 million worth of books. This is a great expense of scrolls that they're burning. What did they do? They pulled the stuff out of their homes and they burnt it. Now, I'm just going to open up the altar right now for prayer. And I'm going to come by. But first of all, you have to stop to repent. So whether you kneel down or you're praying at the altar, come on, church. Come on. It's all open for everybody. You don't have to stand right in front. You can be hiding over in the corner if you want. I don't care where you're at. But if you don't have anything to repent of, you haven't heard anything I said here today. Hallelujah. What did they do? They brought the stuff out of their homes. Because once they got rid of what was bringing demonic warfare into their homes, they were free from it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Cast down that spirit of laziness right now in Jesus' name. Cast down that, that spirit of fear of working right now in Jesus' name. Cast down that spirit of overspending and spending uh, beyond their income in Jesus' name, using your credit cards to do things you shouldn't be doing. Cast down that spirit of mourning right now in Jesus' name. And I, I command it pulled off of you and I send it out in the dry places never to return. If though, that person that's hearing that is not saved, you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior or otherwise it will just come back on you. If you're not saved here today, if you're watching on television or watching live, you never received Jesus, just 
tell Jesus right now, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart right now. Wash me of my sin. Forgive me of my past. All the forms of occult that you have in your home, even the mild ones, God doesn't want it there. Get rid of that occult and those occultic practices and those symbols of the occult in your home. When I came back from Alaska and I was with all the tribes, I was preaching amongst the 13 tribes there, the 13 corporations. Some of them tried giving me some things. I said, what does this symbol mean? And they explained it. I said, I can't have that. That's an occultic symbol. I'll take a tambourine, I'll take a harpoon, but without the symbols. And they understood. And it ministered to them that they didn't need to be selling stuff with the occultic practices on there being Christian natives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free. I command you free. I command you free right now. I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, I command you free right now. In Jesus' name, Father, we love you and we praise you. And we command the, your victimized people to have their glory back and have their throne back in Jesus' name. I command them to come back onto the throne and I command the evil one to be dethroned off of all your people here and over all those that are watching in Jesus' name. And I command it done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Click subscribe, click the thumbs up on our messages, click the little bell. Get your friends saved, get your family saved.